his words who can teach the one who knows all things who can fathom all his wondrous deeds behold our God seated on his throne come let us adore him behold our of sinful man.
Uh, my name is Ollie Hallett and welcome to this 5.30 video from Crossway Stratfords. Uh, you may have gathered this evening with one of our households. Uh, we really hope we're going to start doing that. Um, it's exciting to be able to be a little bit more together on Sundays. Uh, if you want to meet with another household and you're not sure who to ask, um, drop us a message in the box below and we can put you in touch uh, with someone. Or if you're uh, listening in for the first time this evening, again, drop us a line and uh, we'd love to connect with you. Some people think that um, we move in and out of God's good books depending on uh, what we do or how we've been living. Uh, but God says that if we're Christians trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we stand always in grace. Uh, listen to these verses uh, from Romans chapter 5. Through Jesus we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. God's grace means that we, he doesn't treat us as we deserve, but he treats us like his perfect son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's sing together of God's grace in which we stand. days 
to sing God's praise than when we first began. Who, O Lord, could save themselves? say these words together from the book of Hebrews to remind us of the grace we have access to through the Lord Jesus Christ. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's carry on singing of God's abundant grace. Now why this fear and unbelief Has not the Father put to grief His spotless Son for us? And will the righteous judge of man Condemn me for that debt of sin Now cancelled at the cross
complete atonement you have made, and by your death have fully paid the debt your people owe. No wrath remains for us to face, we're sheltered by your saving grace. And sprinkled with your blood Jesus All my trust Is in your blood Jesus You've rescued soul and know this peace, the merits of your great high priest have bought your liberty. Rely then on his precious blood, don't fear your banishment from God, since Jesus sets you free. great high priest have bought your liberty rely then on his precious blood don't fear your banishment from God since Jesus sets you free Let's bow our heads in prayer. Thank you, Father, that through trusting in the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, we have gained the immense privilege of access to you, enjoying your abundant kindness and undeserved favour. We know that we have a sure hope of spending eternity with you in glory and that we enjoy your fatherly kindness and direction every day as we go through this pandemic. This great blessing is all the more incredible given that we deserve nothing but your righteous wrath. So we thank you, Father, for your grace and forgiveness that has given us peace with you through our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. In his name, Amen. Father, we pray for those in the Crossway family who are ill or who have friends and family who are ill, that they would know your grace. We pray that Christians would be strengthened in their faith and hold even more firmly to their sure hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ. For those we know who are not Christians, we pray that they would come to trust in Jesus, turning from their old life, which is opposed to him, and turn to trust in his death and resurrection, and join the Christian family. And of course, we pray that, if it be your will, all those who are ill would be healed. In Jesus' name, Amen. Father, as England increasingly leaves lockdown, may we, as a church family, love our brothers and sisters in Christ by seeking fellowship in our homes and in the newly available restaurants and cafes, etc. We pray that you would give our elders wisdom as they seek to facilitate meetings together as church in the near future. And we pray more churches across the country would be able to do so. May Christians in the UK always reflect upon the abundant grace in which we stand as Christians. In Jesus' name, Amen. Finally, Father, we pray for those who are seeking to run Christian camps to share the good news of the gospel over summer, that some may be able to go ahead online or otherwise. We pray in particular for United Beach Missions, who are putting together evangelistic videos and seeking to run beach missions at short notice. 
uh, we pray that their efforts would bear fruit. We also pray for the leaders of Interaction Belgium, who are seeking to run a Belgium-only camp in line with uh, that country's social distancing rules. May all things be done to your glory, and if it be your will, may many come to trust in Jesus Christ through it, coming to stand in the grace which we all enjoy as those brought from death to life through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. And now we turn to the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Good evening, Crossway. Tonight's reading is going to be from the book of James, chapter 3, verse 13 to chapter 4, verse 12. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? that your passions are at war within you. You desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, He yearned jealously over the spirit that he is made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, Lord and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbour? Are we living for ourselves or for the church? For self or for church? What an absolutely bleak question to start this Sunday evening sermon with, right? And immediately, if we're following the Lord Jesus, it makes us feel guilty because we know that we've got to admit that we've been living for ourselves 
for a large portion of our time, for a large portion of our lives. And if we're first timers tuning in tonight, we might be very tempted right now just to switch off, thinking, okay, thank you very much, found out exactly what kind of church you are, not interested. Uh, if that is you, please don't switch off, please do bear with the sermon. Not least because I think the question really does lie at the heart of what James, Jesus' half-brother, is saying to this church in the first century who he was writing to. I do think the question is born out of the words that we just heard read. Are we living for ourselves or for the church? And look, if you're anything like me, if we uh, are at all aware of ourselves, then we probably want to answer, well, both, right? That is, if we are followers of the Lord Jesus, we probably want to say both. Uh, I live for myself and for the church. I try and do good by the people of God, by the local church which I attend. They're my family in Christ, I get that. But also, I've got to look out for number one every now and again too, right? I need rest, I need respite, I need me time. Both. And maybe I think we want to respond to the question with, well, why does it have to be so stark? Why is it one or the other? Why can't it happily be both? And James is writing to a church in the first century that I think would definitely have answered that question with the answer both. Both and it seems to pretty much be the mark of the church he's writing to. James refers to it as their double-mindedness or two-souledness. Um, it's a having a foot in both camps. We may remember way back when we looked in chapter 1, chapter 1 verse 8, James said, he is a double-minded man. Such a person is a double-minded person, unstable in all their ways. You know, when you've got one foot in the boat, but one foot on the shore, and they're gradually moving apart, well, you're unstable in all your ways. And James says that's true of the believer who is double-minded, who is living for God and for this world, who is living for the here and now and for the future. He says they're double-minded. And we've just had read to us, haven't we, chapter 4, verse 8. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Uh, he's saying this is a church with a foot in both camps. They want to live for Jesus, but they also want to live for self. They want to live for God, but also for the world. They want to live for the future that Jesus will take them to, but they also want to live for the here and now. And James is saying in this letter that ultimately that isn't possible. They've got to choose. I mean, we just had read, haven't we, those shocking words of chapter 4, verse 4, where he says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? They want to be friends with the world and friends with God. And James says, you can't. They're diametrically opposed. You've got to choose one or the other. And it's not just because James is slightly bitter towards the world. Maybe he didn't make much money in life. Maybe he was superseded by others in his career. And he's a bit bitter. He's done with the world. And so he says, you've got to choose. You can't have your cake and eat it. No, 4 verse 20, James says that our eternal souls are at stake. 420, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering, and that word there is the same word for this double-mindedness that James is talking about, whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering, from his to and froing, will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Stop a follower of the Lord Jesus from trying to two-time him, to live for both Jesus and themselves. And he says, and you'll save that person's soul from death and cover a multitude of their sins. Ultimately, James says, our eternal destiny is on the line. We've got to choose. And today we're thinking about whether or not we're living for ourselves or for the church, which we will see is very, very tightly tied to and reveals whether or not we're living for God or the world. James says, are we living for ourselves or for the church? 
And it's a terrifying question, isn't it? The truly wise pursue corporate peace. The truly wise pursue corporate peace. Corporate peace, uh, it sounds a bit like business speak, doesn't it? What does that mean? Uh, I'm just using the word corporate as opposed to individual. Uh, trying to highlight that James is saying those who are really wise, they pursue the benefit of the church, of the whole people of God, rather than of their own gain here and now in this world. And as we're thinking about whether or not we're serving self or the church, James wants to, at the beginning of these verses, highlight again for us what seems to be the real problem of this double-minded church, or rather the way in which their double-mindedness works itself out in their lives. Because it seems that this is a church where a lot of them are saying they trust in Jesus, saying they have faith in him, that they have in that sense a correct orthodox theology, but they're not living in light of that faith. Uh, we might say they're all words and no actions kind of people, or all mouth and no trousers. And those of us um, who have good memories may remember when we looked at chapter 2, or may just have in the recesses of our minds, those verses of chapter 2, 14 to 16. They're really quite well known, aren't they? Probably the best known in James, where he says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can that faith save him? And then he gives the example of a brother or sister, poorly clothed, lacking in daily food. And one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, without then actually giving them the things needed for the body. And James says, what good is that kind of faith? All words, no action. In particular, James says that these are all words and no action kind of Christians in regards to the way that they live in relationship to one another. They say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, but then the way they treat their brothers and sisters, well, it suggests that maybe they're living for self and not for God after all. And so the same tongues that they use to sing praises to God, well, they're the, they're the same tongues they use to badmouth one another. James is saying there's internal divisions in the church uh, which looks like them favouring the rich in church and overlooking the poor. Uh, they're the kind of believers who are often found judging one another, seemingly not just in their minds but also out loud, gossiping about one another behind one another's back. And we'll see later, we've already had read for us, that actually these internal divisions, well they're leading to all-out quarrels. These believers who say that they follow Jesus, live for God, live for the future, they expose the fact that they're living for self now by the fact that rather than serving the body of Christ, that is, his people, the church, they're all about number one. And ultimately, it seems they're far too in it for themselves. And into that context, in 3 verse 1, James turns to the leadership, to the teachers, and he gives the implications for them. And the implication is, not many people should, 3 verse 1, become teachers. Why? Well, in summary, it seems that he says not many should become teachers because the same tongue that they use in their job, in the service of God, speaking his truths, well, it's the same tongue that exposes whether or not they live in light of that as they say all sorts of other things in their daily life that contradict the theology they espouse. So 3 verse 9, and it's true of all of us, with it we bless our Lord and Father, our tongue, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. And James says, look guys, those who lead the people of God, they're going to be judged more severely, they'll be judged for how they've led the people of God, They'll be held to that standard, and given what we do with our tongues, whew, be slow to want to lead the people of God. 
And then continuing in that vein, verse 13, if that's true, who should we be choosing as our guides? Who are the wise ones, as it were, that we should be following? And James seems to say it's not principally those who talk a good talk from the pulpit, but rather those who walk the good walk Monday to Saturday. And so 3 verse 13, do we see, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. It's not in the espousing that you believe in Jesus that we think, oh, you're a wise one to follow. But it's in how the, the pastor or the elder, the deacon, the Bible study leader relates to the rest of the church. Are they self-servers in church, in church life? Or are they seeking church growth? Are they seeking church unity, church peace? You see, James says the real thing we want to be looking out for is their motivations. So yeah, fair play, maybe they preached a blinder of a sermon. But why did they do it? What was their motivation as they were preparing? And I feel terrified. <laughs> I feel terrified having to say that to you as someone who really does want to preach good sermons. Why do I? For self gain or for the promotion of love among the brothers and sisters? What governs who these wise ones speak to at the end of a church service? What do they do when there's disputes in the church? Do they side with those who are influential or do they try and be impartial and seek peace among the warring factions? Do they care more about the fact that they are loved or do they care that the church is a place of unity as everyone loves one another, forgiving one another our many wrongs? James says, who is the truly wise one? Well, by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. And do we see in these verses, there are two sources, two founts of wisdom. There are two wisdoms, as it were. There's the wisdom of God, the wisdom from above, and there's the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of the earth below. And James says, that anyone who, verse 14, has bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in their hearts, boasting about themselves, well, they're clearly someone who is living by, governed by, not the wisdom that comes from above, but rather from below. It's an earthly wisdom that has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit, and rather than coming from God, goodness me, he says it comes from the demons. It's satanic. A demonic thing, this self-service. And he contrasts that obviously with the wisdom that comes from above, which is heavenly in contrast, is spiritual. It is of the Holy Spirit, given by the Spirit. And it's found, well, it's God, it is divine. And what does such wisdom look like? Well, it's pure, verse 17, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And do you see how different the life of one governed by God's wisdom is? That kind of leader, that kind of person, well, there's someone who is peaceable, for example. They're seeking peace among the brothers, gentle rather than harsh when dealing with the brothers, someone who's open to reason. It's not always their way or the highway. They're full of mercy rather than judging those who are not like them. They're impartial rather than favouring those who can get them a leg up, a rung up on the ladder. Two wisdoms revealed in two ways of living, two ways of engaging with the church. And James says it really matters 
whether or not the people we're following are truly wise, whether they're heavenly wise rather than earthly wise, because, look at verse 15, look at the results in church life. Uh, sorry, verse 16, look at the results in church life. Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, of course, if the leader is someone who is seeking selfish gain, uh, who's pitting people against one another for the sake of their benefit, who's favouring those who can in turn scratch their back, of course that creates divisions amongst the church. Whereas the wisdom from above, well look at the fruit of that verse 18, it leads to a harvest of righteousness. James might there just mean righteousness in the believer's life or, or the righteousness that means that they get eternal life. It might be talking about the individual person who lives rightly and so there's a harvest of righteousness on the day of harvest. But I think given that we get this contrast between the two wisdoms, he's probably contrasting it against the disorder and every vile practice generated by self-service. And he says opposed to that heavenly wisdom leads the person to be other person centric, seeking peace among the brothers and sisters. And there's this harvest of righteousness among the church. It's a kind of other person centeredness that leads to more and more right living among the people of God. That, says James, is what will be the result of following the truly wise, the heavenly wise person. And so James says, we've got to be on the lookout for those who are truly wise and understanding. Odd, isn't it? We are strangely drawn to self-serving leaders. I see that because in the times when I have been in leadership and self-serving, it is quite easy to attract people to following me in whatever pathetic little thing it was that I was leading. And I think it, it does make sense, doesn't it, that if I'm saying, well, actually, only some people are in and there are favourites, well, I want to be one of the favourites. I want to be in. Uh, and so very quickly, I can find myself drawn to this person, trying to please that person. And James says, they are not a wise leader. You do not want to follow that kind of person. Now, who is wise and understanding? Who are the ones to emulate? Well, it's those who have true heavenly wisdom and so aren't thinking about self-gain, but are thinking about the body as a whole. The truly wise pursue corporate peace. Having talked about the true wisdom uh, that comes from above and its fruit of peace and unity and a harvest of righteousness, James then immediately contrasts that, do we see, with the lived experience of this first century church he's writing to, who are experiencing actually far more um, the disorder of chapter 3 uh, verse 16 that comes from jealousy and selfish ambition. And he's warning them that self-serving worldliness makes you an enemy of God. What lies at the heart of the tensions that they experience within them, 4 verse 1, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions or pleasures are at war within you? You desire, verse 3 again, you spend it on your passions. James is talking about their passions, their desires. They're seeking of self-satisfaction now, wanting to get everything they can from this world for themselves. They're not living for God, not living for the future, they're living for themselves now. And James says it's causing all of this tension, rivalry, in church life. Verse 2, he says, you desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. And I don't think he's saying there that they literally wait for one another out back at the end of the church service on a Sunday with their flick knives ready. Now, I think he's purposely using the same extreme language that Jesus used in Matthew 5 to describe anger as basically being mental murder when I say, I wish you dead. And James says, you do not have 
because you do not ask. And here he's not moved on to the prosperity gospel. And um, he's not saying, oh, guys, you could be really rich if only you just asked God, if only you had enough faith. No, he's writing to a church who, in 1 verse 2, we were told, are suffering various kinds of trials. In 2 verse 6, we saw that they're oppressed by the rich, being taken to court, dragged to court by the rich, who want to fleece them of every last penny. 5 verse 4, we're going to see that the rich are actually defrauding some of them of their wages. So these guys, I think, uh, they're praying just for their basic needs. That they want to have enough money to live off. They want peace in their society so they can be averagely prosperous. It's not just a prayer for a really shiny bike or the best car or the biggest house. And James is saying, at the end of verse 2, they don't have those things because they don't ask. And he's not highlighting that, um, actually, we all just need to pray and God will provide. He's highlighting what's wrong in their heart. He says, it's obvious that you guys are about your self-gain because you're not coming to God and asking him for it. You know it's about you and not about him. In fact, he goes on to say in verse 3, you ask, you know, when you do bother coming to God to ask for these things, you don't receive them. Why? Because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. When they do bother asking God for help with their daily needs, you know, give us today our daily bread, it's not so they can seek his kingdom come, his will be done. It's so that their kingdom can come, their will be done. And so James says, you're not asking God. And when you do bother coming to him, you're not being given them because God knows that you're all about yourself now. And obviously we've got to recognise that isn't always the case. Sometimes God does give people the riches they crave as they wander away from him. And that, if anything, is even more scary, isn't it? as we see that friendship with the world is enmity of, with God. But here at least he's saying that those believers weren't being given those things because God knew what they were really about after all. And so as a result of lacking these things, well, bitterness arises if they can't get what they're living for, envy, rivalry between them. And because they're not a big deal in the world, it always happens, doesn't it, that in the small world of the church, I want to be a big deal there. And maybe they're jealous of the brother or sister who does have a, ha a nice house while they're still living in a council flat. And they're raging because they're living for themselves now and they haven't got the things that they think will provide them satisfaction. And it causes all sorts of enmity and disorder. And James says that such thinking is adultery. Verse 4, you adulterous people. You Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? You cannot be friends with both the world and God. The world in the sense of living for the world and for God. You can't do it. You've got to choose. What are you living for? He says if you're living for the world, it's as bad as committing adultery with the, girl, the world when you're married to God. It's as though you've left your husband, your wife's bed and gone to the lover to sleep with them now too. You can't do both, you've got to choose. Are you going to stick with your wife, stick with your husband or go with the lover? Because God is like a faithful husband or wife who, in verse 5, yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. God is rightly jealous of our affection. He wants what is due him, like a wife would want what is due her from her husband. Fidelity, faithfulness, love and affection. But James says, as these guys are seeking self-glory now, it's exposing the fact that they're living for the world two time in God. And he's jealous for their wholehearted affection. I wonder, would we have ever said that whether or not I'm living for the sake of the church, for my brothers and sisters, was such a serious thing in God's eyes? that putting self before church is such a big deal. You know, when I think of worldliness, I think of sex, drugs, rock and roll, you know, the excesses of licentious living, hedonism. James thinks about bad-mouthing brothers and sisters, making jokes at their expense, gossiping, getting my own back, not forgiving, 
grumbling against that brother or sister who I don't see eye to eye with, wanting others to pick my team over theirs. And James says it's so serious, this worldliness, that if I continue down that path, I may genuinely find that I have become on the last day an enemy of God. And that is a different world from what I think when I think about whether or not I can serve self rather than you lot. And so James is going to come on to say to us, look, we need to repent. But before then, let me just say that I think we obviously are rather more blessed in our unity at Crossway than this first century church. We don't seem to have these all-out quarrels, do we, on a Sunday? And it's not just because Zoom has stopped us from punching one another. Now, I think we really are quite united, aren't we? But it may be that Partly our unity is driven by the fact that we're a young church. It's not just gospel fruit, but also we haven't had time yet to get to know each other and really dislike one another. You know, 15, 20 years down the line, we probably see more of the differences, humanly speaking, between one another. Um, We're also a relatively big church, aren't we? So maybe we can hide behind the fact that I just ignore the people I don't like and get on loving the people I do like, the people like me. And I was thinking maybe also we're helped by the fact helped in in the wrong sense by the fact that we're a London church you know so actually I don't really have to do life with you if I don't want to I just see you for a bit on a Sunday I don't even have to see you in small groups if you're not in my small group and so it's very easy to think oh yeah, yeah yeah I'm living for the church not for self but maybe those things mask the fact that we are still living for self and even if it's not as bad as the situation there uh, in the first century, maybe we've got a bit of correcting to do in our own hearts. And look, I don't want to overly burden us with guilt that isn't ours. We're not quarrelling, and so I don't think we need to weep before the Lord about quarrelling. We're not doing. But if James is saying there's a choice, are we going to live for self or church? Are we going to live for this world or for God? Well, why don't we, even while we haven't gone too far down the wrong lane, as it were, think about how we can run as far as possible towards the worldly wisdom that keeps us safe and friends with God? And so I was thinking maybe we could assess in our own hearts, individually, collectively, what does my prayer life reveal about whether or not I'm living for self or the church? What does my diary reveal? Um, Who am I arranging to meet? Now that we're uh, lifted out of lockdown and able to see uh, six people, uh, five other people, who am I arranging to meet? Um, What decides whether or not I have a Zoom chat with that brother or sister after a long day at work? What decides whether or not I stay after this part of the meeting for Zoom coffee and chat? And actually I start to feel aware, even just asking those questions, that I have got more running to do towards the heavenly wisdom of seeking to serve church rather than self. And so maybe without flagellating myself unduly, I do want to be thinking, okay, no, 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 I've chosen God's way, I've chosen the church, and I really want to see that fruit of righteousness, that harvest that comes from peaceful living in my life, in our church life. Self-serving worldliness makes us an enemy of God. And just as we're about to give up all hope under the weight of the recognition that we too are double-minded, gloriously we now turn to our third point, where James says, How glorious are the words of verse 6. For verse 6, those first words, But he, God, gives more grace. God gives more grace, so repent. And boy, do I need a lot of grace. Verse 6 continues. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And that first part, God opposes the proud, that's been very evident so far in the verses, hasn't it? He has no time, no place in his kingdom for boastful self-service. 
But humility, on the other hand, well, God loves that. The humility that he spoke of already is meekness in 3.13. That which belongs to true heavenly wisdom. An attitude that recognises that I am no big deal at all. I'm not about me, I'm about God and I'm about others. I'm about the church. I'm about his future. That kind of humility is something God loves. But here, James is saying it's also that humility that says, I have not been humble as I ought. I have been proud and so I come to you for forgiveness. Please give me your undeserved favour. And James says there's more grace. He gives grace to the humble. And I absolutely love that word more. Because more is in contrast to the sin, the level of sin, isn't it? Do you sin that much? More grace. That much? More grace. That much? More grace. And we might be thinking to ourselves, look, I have been so double-minded. And he says, yeah, so much more grace. I've spent years living for self, not for God, not for other people, not for his church. Yeah, yeah, more grace. I've been so selfish. More grace. You have no idea the things I've said and done against brothers and sisters. You have no idea how much more grace there is. God gives more grace. But this isn't just cheap forgiveness, is it? No, do we see in these verses it definitely is calling for true repentance. Feet in both camps and he's saying, guys, it's time to choose both feet in camp God. Verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, done with him. Draw near, verse 8, to God. Cleanse your hands. You uh, Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Wash your hands of what you've been doing. Put that sin to death, that self-service. Put it to bed. Stop living for self-glory, self-ambition. And verse 9, well, for those of us who have been really finding joy in living for self now... He says it's going to look like a time of being wretched and mourning and weeping. Of recognising our sin and grieving the thing that we put to death. Gone. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. There's going to be a coming back to God, a reckoning and a sadness as we recognise that actually we've been double-minded. And maybe some of us are realising, look, that is what I need to do. I need to do serious business with God. Uh, Maybe for what we've been talking about this morning, maybe for other things, other ways in which we've been worldly. But look, God gives more grace. So repent. And if we do, look at the three incredible promises that we get in these verses. Verse 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. I love that promise because I, I believe the lie all the time, the lie that Satan loves to tell us that he's too powerful, that the temptation is too much, that we have to give in, that we're under his control, that there's nothing we can do about it. We're too far gone in that sin. And James says, the Holy Spirit through James says, not true. If you today decide you are going to resist Satan, if that's what I decide, I'm going to say no to temptation, then he has no choice but to flee from the believer. Because Jesus has won in that person's heart, the Holy Spirit indwells them, they belong to him now. Satan doesn't have the power he pretends to have over us. Resist him, and he's got no choice but to flee. Oh, why am I giving in? Shut up, Satan, be gone. What a beautiful promise. What a beautiful reality. And then also, the wonder of verse 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's that Luke 15 picture, isn't it, of the prodigal son who says to his father, I want you dead, give me the inheritance cash now, goes off and spends it, realises he's been a fool. And as he comes back to his father, 
He doesn't think he'll be accepted back as a son, but hopes to be accepted as a servant, a slave. And instead, his father sees him from far off and he picks up his robes and he pegs it towards his son. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's that first hug after you've asked forgiveness and the person has said, okay, I forgive you. And you reach out and they reach back. That beautiful reconciliation that's promised here, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And then finally, verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. It is a very, very, very costly thing, isn't it, to give up living for self now? But it's made so much easier once we know that God has promised that he will exalt us for that because of Christ, but as it were, as we humble ourselves before him and trust in Christ, God promises to exalt us in the future, to give us a crown of life that we do not deserve, to let us share in the glory and eternal life that should only belong to Jesus. And what a day of exaltation it will be when God says to those of us who should be his enemies, come home, friend, share in my many, many riches forever. God gives more grace, so repent. Those of us who are following along on, uh, with the handout will notice there's a fourth point on there. Uh, that's mainly to help us, to steer us in our own personal reading of these verses. But for now, we have been given so much to feast on, haven't we, in what we've already looked at. We have been given such a weighty meal, almost too much to bear at points. And we come back to that question we asked at the beginning. Are we living for ourselves or for the church? Which James says reveals a bigger, starker choice that we're making. Are we living for the world or for God? Who are we friends with? And some of us might be thinking, look, if I'm really honest, I've never been a friend of God. I've always been a friend of the world. Others may be thinking, yeah, I am a friend of God, but I've been wandering for a while. Either way, that there will be a fair few of us who are ready to repent, to turn back to God, to come to his throne, and to ask for forgiveness. And as we do, gloriously, James says, we will find more grace. We'll find a God who draws near and who gives us the strength to resist temptation, to resist Satan. And with all of that, we have the incredible promise of an eternal exaltation. What a wonderful thing it is to be a friend of God. Why don't I lead us in prayer? Oh, Father, you know um, how quickly we find ourselves drawn back to the world, how slowly we find ourselves drawing back to you. Thank you so much for these very heavy but important words. Thank you so much for more grace. Please, would you help us to turn back to you or to stick with you? Would you help us to pursue heavenly wisdom? And would we find ourselves being friends with you rather than on that last day realising tragically that we're your enemies? And we ask that in your Son's name. Amen. Through the book of James this evening, God has challenged us to humble ourselves before him. And it may be that some of us have been convicted of dangerous double-mindedness, uh, or others of us may not be in that position, but either way, uh, confessing our sin before God um, keeps us in that humble place that James wants us to be in. And so let's use these words to confess our sin to God together and ask for uh, his abundant grace to bring change. 
Jesus Christ, risen Master and triumphant Lord, we come to you in sorrow for our sins and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. We have lived by the light of our own eyes. We have lived for this world and doubted our home in heaven. In your mercy, forgive us, hear us and help us. Amen. Our next song is honest about what our hearts uh, can be like um, and ask God for more grace to bind ourselves to him. Let's sing together. Of mercy never ceasing. Quite 
by grace I am restored, and now I freely walk into the arms of Christ my Lord. Let me lead us in prayer. Father, we thank you again for your abundant grace um, available to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that your grace reaches far and wide. Thank you that your grace has called us to enter in. And we pray that uh, wherever we're coming from this evening, uh, we would be quick to turn to you, knowing that you welcome us, welcome us back with open arms. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God says that um, his people, the church, grow um, not just as we hear God's truth being taught to us, but as we speak God's truth into each other's lives. And so we're going to hear now a few reflections from uh, different people uh, on the truth we've heard this evening. And I really hope it will help us all to think about how what God has said to us um, impacts us personally. The fact that we're even having to think about this and choose demonstrates that there's a big problem. Um, but it is so, so difficult. It's really hard. I think half the time we don't even realise that we are being double-minded. Um, and so perhaps we think we're just embracing God's good gift towards us, such as jobs, relationships, responsibility, uh, but not realising that perhaps they're in, they are becoming idols. And sometimes I think I can fool myself into thinking that it's necessary to be friends of the world, to love my non-Christian brothers and sisters better. But James calling this out as double-mindedness sitting in both camps quickly forces us to pick our allegiance and to know where our attitudes and values should come from. Earthly wisdom is described as demonic. It's just really quite like, obviously a stark contrast between serving God I feel that it can be too easy for us to lose sight of the special blessings that God has given us through the church and how he has designed it to nurture us and protect us and to make us more like Christ. But as with anything, there can be a temptation to slack off, to avoid the difficult parts or to rationalise doing things that we should reject. Um, I think maybe one of the reasons why it can be tough to serve the church over serving ourselves could be maybe we just haven't really understood that connection between loving God and serving his people. It's just helpful seeing how serving God and serving the world is defined as serving the church or serving self because I think we can we would all say oh yeah I serve God um, if you're a Christian but actually that looks like serving the church and that almost seems more challenging doing zoom coffee after church like i know often i can just finish church and just think oh i'm too tired or something or i'm wearing pajamas but it's actually so helpful to others i think to just make that effort and talk to people and chat after church the areas where we find it hard to serve the church could depend on our personality, or our gifts, or our income, or our friends, or our family. Perhaps we're more hesitant to serve our brothers and sisters when there's a tangible cost, or when something looks like a thankless task, if we let ourselves forget that God sees all of our works. I find it most tough to serve the church when things of the world are distracting me, and I feel that they require my attention more. It can make serving us take a back seat in terms of priorities until I realise the need to shift the dependency on myself to God and his work. So we can live wholeheartedly for God, knowing that God gives more grace to double-minded people, so people like us. Um, the fact that God draws near to, to us as we draw near to him and just shows us that he gives us the the strength that, that we need to, to live this countercultural life where we're not looking out for ourselves, where we're not we're not chasing after worldly things. Um, 
but yeah he gives us more grace and as we come humbly and as we come repentant that he will lift us up and he will exalt us we're reminded that christ has already won the victory over sin and death that god is gracious and that his grace increases with our need for his grace and that we are forgiven completely the passage is also giving us stern warnings against returning to our old ways of self-centeredness it ends by showing us the glorious conclusion of Christ exalted and enthroned in splendour, sharing his glory with his redeemed church in the new creation. And I'm so glad for that last bit about grace because it just seems so hard and so impossible. But it's just so encouraging that any amount of sin that we've done, God's grace is more and I am enabled to live in an unselfish way. And I know it's not gonna happen overnight, but it's that uh, commitment to serve God and not self, and that commitment to serve others and not self. And like God will help us in that. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, when this video ends, there's going to be a Zoom call, which we'd love you to join us on if you're able to. Uh, we break out into smaller groups, and so it's a brilliant chance to connect with different people from the church family. So whether you're part of the church already or just listening in this evening, uh, we'd love you to join us on that. But let me close our time in prayer. Let's pray together. James says, God gives more grace. Therefore, the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Our Father, we thank you for your abundant grace in which we stand if we're in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, we pray that this evening you would convict us of the things that we need to um, hear from you. And that we would be quick to turn to you through the Lord Jesus and receive your abundant grace and bring change. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, friend of sinners, love me ere I knew you. Drew me with his cords of love, tied me back. Jesus, friend of sinners, the crown of thorns you wore for me, bruised for my transgression, pierced for my iniquity. Tell the story. Redeem.